podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors. This is episode 49, Bob. Oh, God. I know. We're flying through them. And this episode is all around compassion fatigue in therapy, although you have just said this happens anywhere. Well, yes, in lots of different places, but we'll we'll start off looking at the process in therapy. Yes. It's a big thing, compassion fatigue. Yeah, yeah. How do you see the compassion th- fatigue then in your uh, practice or from where you, you're standing? What do you think about it? I think in the early days, when I first qualified and was first seeing clients, I think I probably over-identified a lot more than what I do now, maybe. Um, yeah. I, I can remember, I think I might have had this conversation with the supervisor and saying it was like I had a bit of a, a radar on the top of my head and it just soaked everything in. And I was told that over time that would not happen. And I think that's true. Oh, so you're sort of likening this to sort of what I would call a compulsive caretaking position. Yeah, well, that's me. I was a, I was a child minder. I've always worked with kids. I'm an ex-foster carer. I'm now a psychotherapist. So it's, it's kind of in my DNA. Not being a compulsive caretaker. Yeah. So compassion fatigue is something to really look out for with you then. It, it definitely, and I definitely felt it in, in the early days, more so than what I do now. But having said that, sometimes the universe brings us clients that are kind of going through similar things than what we are. So how did it um, manifest for you then in those days? I found it hard to shake off the client once the session had finished. Oh. And that, that was one of my big concerns when I started seeing clients at home. I had this sort of fantasy that it would taint my house, <laughs> if that made sense. What would taint you? Say a little bit more about that. Just the, the feelings of, you know, therapy, basically, or being a therapist. Like I said, I used to struggle shaking a client off. Yeah. We had a, you know, quite a an in-depth session it would take me a while to come down from it so you would sort of take the feelings on maybe like you know in a litmus paper process yeah yeah whereas when I was like working from MIP I had the drive home so I could kind of you know I don't know just talk myself down on the 45 minute drive back home whereas when I was seeing clients in my home I did have a fear that it would stay there for a bit longer. Uh-huh. I think, um, yeah, it's a good way to describe it, I think. I think when you talk about compassion fatigue, we're often talking about uh, the, a transferential position mm. where we over-identify. Yeah. I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. That's why one of the signs of that would be to maybe constantly constantly think about your client when you go home or even dream about your client um and you know it's a good phrase what you said i think have difficulty shaking off yeah the thought the images the d- desires or whatever the transference is with your client yeah and worrying about them in between sessions that was another thing that i used to do a lot of mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. See, the way to get through this is supervision, supervision, therapy, therapy. Yeah, hundred percent. So if you have your take care of yourself. Yeah. Yourself, have therapy, have supervision. Um, then you can lessen the effects of so-called compassion fatigue. Yeah. But you have to take care of yourself professionally at that level, I think. Therapy definitely particularly 
and peer groups and colleagues and things like yeah. that. Yeah. I think for me, it, it was about learning and understanding, you know, particularly through the assessment process and everything that the client, you know, was okay at taking care of themselves as well. It wasn't my job to take care of them in between sessions. <laughs> that was a big thing that I needed to learn to do. Yeah, the, the clients, when you say, okay, I do know what you mean, that they they have a responsibility themselves. to Yeah, be... and enough adult capacity to take care of themselves, yeah. Well, some, I sort of hesitated because for some clients, of course, they're so badly damaged that um, their self-care process mm. is limited. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yes and no, really. I, I understand where you're coming from in terms of compassion fatigue, but you know, some clients are so damaged that they don't know how to take care of themselves. Yeah. I think the big thing is it's not your responsibility uh, to take ownership of that position. Yeah. Because as well, I, I don't know how you feel about it, but. I did kind of have a bit of an insight or a realisation at some point that if I take on the hurt and, and their feelings, it's kind of disempowering them because it's not my trauma. It's not my stuff. Well, it certainly isn't your... Yeah, yeah. Your trauma, that's for damn sure. Yeah. But, it, it you know, it, it sometimes, and with some clients in the early days, it you know, it, it felt like that. It felt like it was your trauma. Yeah. It, you know, like I said, it took me a while to shake it off. There was definitely physiological stuff going on for me after mm. the session, yeah. So then therapy and supervision are crucial. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting for a lot of uh, counsellors, they, they don't have um, that recommendation requirement that you have therapy. I know. And I think this is a perfect example of how not taking care of yourself in understanding and reflecting and dealing with the positive identification that transference can lead to great challenges. Yeah. And it, you know, it is a tough job being a psychotherapist sometimes because people only come to you when, you know, things are bad. They don't come and, you know, bouncing through the door and tell you all the good things that are going on in the life. No, they wouldn't. No, no, no. That is, that's absolutely true. So, you, you know, you if you have, you know, four or five clients in a day, that's four or five hours of people, you know, talking about a lot of deep, you know, sometimes negative things. It, it's, you need to take care of yourself. Mm. And the problem comes when you don't have that therapeutic support yeah. or that supervision uh, and you're attempting to deal with the transferential implications or the positive identification by yourself yeah that's a very dangerous position well dangerous is a strange word but it's a very challenging position yes yeah and like you say you know there's a, there's a lot of counselors out there that it, it's not it's not mandatory it's not something that they need to do so and I, I don't know whether supervision is taught to them on their training, you know, and the, the, you know, the value of it. I think supervision is, but <clears throat> I don't think, uh, well, I know that the, in the counselling training, it's, it's maximum is about 20 hours therapy. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know because I only know doing it through the transactional analysis world. But, you know, like I think I've said it in this podcast before, I didn't think there was anything wrong with me until I started training to be a psychotherapist. Yeah. You know, and, and it, it, it is possible for us to get triggered when we're in the therapy room with a client, if we've not worked through our own stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, it, and if you haven't worked through your own stuff, you're very open to what we're talking about here in terms mm. of compassion fatigue, compulsive caretaking, or compulsive, and it's a psychological term, but anyway, compulsive rescuing. 
Yeah. Which it helps no one. No. No, I, I think, you know, that was what I was meaning earlier on when I said it, it disempowers the client. It, you know, if we're constantly rescuing and giving them all the answers and trying to fix everybody, it's it's disempowering. I do believe that, you know, with support and educative psychotherapy and everything, the majority of us have the answers in us. We just don't know where they are. Mm. Mm. So you usually find, especially when um, students start their placements, so they start their, you know, the beginning of their clinical life, if you like. Yeah. Um, the sort of position you're talking about here, or what we're talking about here, um, often rears its head because the early, early, early therapist often comes from a position that they believe they have to do something. Mm. They have to rescue the client in some sort of way. Yeah. And, um, often they come into this, often they come into therapy because they're attracted to that actually in the compulsive caretaking place. Yeah. But they often come into therapy thinking they have to do something and they sort of almost, I don't mean this in a patronizing way, but they find it hard to take on board that actually the doing bit is actually being rather than actionistic doing. Mm. And that is you is a very common um, process we find with beginning therapists. Yeah, and it's something I went through. Oh. You know, I, I think that's one of the things why I I'm always <clears throat> talking about MIP <laughs> and how good the training is because you know it's a four year course, but two years in, once you pass your competencies, yeah, you're seeing clients, but you're still under the umbrella and the support yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> for another two years. So mm. you kind of, you know, it's not like you just suddenly been trained and released into the world. You've got two years of, you know, contact with yourself as the trainer of supervision as part of the course. You know, it, it, I, that's what I loved. I don't think I'd be practicing now if I'd have done it any other way. No, I think it's really important to take care of yourself and yeah. have the therapeutic support, have the supervision and move away from a compulsive caretaking place for yourself and what we're talking about here, but also for the clients, which you identified at the beginning of this podcast. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And, and, you know, I love the way that you said sometimes it's just being as opposed to doing. <laughs> we don't need to do lots of things. Which again, I suppose it's a comfort blanket when you're first qualified is that, you know, you, you have lots of things that you're kind of using, you know, strategies and forms to fill out and questionnaires and this and that just because it, it's uncomfortable to just be in the room and go with whatever comes up rather than having a plan. I think for um, a lot of therapists, beginning therapists per se, um, being is a real challenge. Yeah. Because actually they come from a place often where they're high achievers in their professions or they've uh, got lots of strokes from doing things. And being, uh, just being, is very challenging for, for them. And yeah. that's a real art. And often a lot of therapy is needed from that and a lot of supervision. To, to sort of be able to uh, be. Now yeah. that, may say straight, that might sound strange to people listening. I don't know if it does or it doesn't, but if there's always been a concentration on doing something, a person will feel a void or very odd, you know, if they're not taking the space to attempt to solve things for people. Yeah. And there's something as well about if if we're constantly doing things in the therapy room, often it can be really cognitive and they're in the thinking and a lot of the time as opposed to going into feeling where, you know, I, I've been, you know, I've had the honour of being on one of your therapy marathon weekends where, yeah, it, it, to sit on a couch with somebody and say nothing is really powerful. It's a, it's a real challenge for a lot yeah, of Yeah, yeah. But, but if we're not doing things, 
a lot of the time we get out of our head and we go to a, a different place, which is is what we, you know, is helpful in therapy. Mm, mm. And I think that a lot of people, especially student therapists, again, get so overwhelmed when they have to um, reflect on being as a mm. major part of the therapeutic process. But sometimes they learn that it's not for them because yeah. they, they've actually um, come into the place of being a therapist from such a compulsive caretaking position that it's too overwhelming if they're then thrust into um, the challenge of looking at what being, what, you know, what being actually means for them. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've seen clients that, that come with that as, you know, one of the, the barriers that they've got is that they need to be doing something all the time. You know, mm. their anxiety or, or their overthinking or whatever it is happens when they've nothing to do. So right. to have a safe space in a room where they can explore that and be okay with it is, is you know, it's really useful. Mm. Absolutely. And so people can get really fatigued. That's mm. why it's called passion fatigue for from the um, script position often of feeling they always have to do things and show um, compulsive compassion all the time. And if they're not doing that, then something's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And th there is that over identification that we've already touched on. You know, I think it did take me a while to work out whose feelings are whose sometimes in the early days. You know, is this mine or is this theirs? It was, I don't know, the energy was just in the room and it was quite confusing as to whose it was at times. Which sounds a bit woo woo when you think about it. Uh, well, yes and no, but you see, uh... In life, no, it, it, I'm not talking about being a psychotherapist or a counsellor in the mental health provisions, but you don't go around thinking, well, whose feelings are this? It's not part of your daily process in life. So, you know, therapists and counsellors are entering a profession mm. where that is a crucial question they need to ask themselves. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad it wasn't just me then. <laughs> And if they don't ask themselves that question and they take on all the trauma, the misery, the depression, the hurt uh, that we're often dealing with in the therapeutic process, um, they will have great challenges and we could use the word fatigue, but they will, they will have, uh, they'll find this job hard. Mm. I can remember as well, I'm not sure whether we've touched on it on any previous podcasts about, you know, the, the clients that we take on as therapists and kind of like an 80 20 rule as to, you know, the type of clients that we take on, which is another way of, you know, making sure that we, we don't burn out as therapists. Yeah. So let's explain for the listeners what 80 20 rule is. Well, kind of, you know, I know we've spoke about it in past, you know, sessions about the, the walking worried and things like that, taking up 80% and the other 20% that maybe have more specific or deep, deeper trauma. Um, and to be mindful of the clients that you're taking on so as, you know, you're avoiding that compassion fatigue. Uh, that, that's right. And I think it's, it's another trap for beginning therapists to take on many, 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 many clients for various reasons. And um, certainly if they're going to go and be, it, it, it put themselves in a position where client after client in the day, um, you know, is deeply scarred, deeply traumatized, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they believe they've got a cure or to help the person heal themselves with the trauma mm -hmm. every hour, they will, certainly have fatigue very quickly yeah and be no use to themselves or texting the client yeah. yeah so they need to take care of themselves uh you know when you i'm always interested when um the uh, beginning therapists particularly but also very experienced therapists you know uh when you ask them how many clients do you see in a day for example yeah and they say 
Oh, 708. And, you know, that's a remarkable, remarkable response. Mm. Oh, four in the morning, four in the afternoon. Uh, it's a remarkable response, especially if the therapist works in, a lot with the disturbed um, population. Yeah. I, I, I did do that for a short period of time when I was working in Manchester and renting a room or hiring a room. Um, yeah, but I certainly don't do that now. And I, I realised quite early on that this is this is not good. <laughs> it's not good for me and it's not good for the clients either. Should be half that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. I... I I work because I work from home. So I work, I kind of split it up into mornings, afternoons or, you know, daytime and then evenings. A lot of my clients are in the evening. Um, so it's starting from five o'clock, you know, and I finish at nine o'clock. I'm usually seeing two or three tops, but generally just two in each section. Oh. Yeah. Certain people need to have, I think the prerequisite, and I'll keep repeating it and I feel I'm laboring it, but therapy is so, so, so crucial. Mm. So you can differentiate out what's your own trauma and what's the other person's trauma or what's yeah. your own feelings and what's the other person's feelings. And it doesn't get lumped up. And without that therapy or that uh, person who's going to help you differentiate from your own script, if you like, in TA terms, yeah. your, your client script, fatigue will... Or, or challenges which will happen yeah i think it, you know it, it might be worth mentioning as well about you know if if we're going through something yeah sorry i'm just going to let the dog in yeah you're all right yes you're right That's... you know if, if we've been through a grief or you know something like that or going through a divorce or whatever it is that you know we need to be mindful of how we're going to be in in that room and whether we're going to be serving our clients to the best of our ability if we're not taking care of ourselves and it might be to take some time out well now you're into a very very important area if you've got you know trauma in your own life loss in your own life bereavement in your own life and not only it's happening in the here and now, but maybe triggering off trauma from the past. Yeah. I think it's only ethical to take time out. Yeah. Me too. And if you don't, I think, okay, it might be a distraction for you, but it doesn't help the client. No, no, but... You... I think it can go both ways, you see. I think the therapist can pass their own trauma on, actually, to the client. Mm. The client doesn't realise it. So they actually feel worse when they go out the door. Yeah. Now the therapist might feel better, but the client can feel damn side worse yeah. because they're taking on the therapist um, loss, grief, trauma. Yeah. And like you say, it, you know, it probably is unethical in one respect if you're not in the right frame of mind yourself with whatever's going on personally to be, you know, working with a client. Oh, it's definitely unethical, and I think the supervisor needs to uh, point that out to the therapist mm. um, pretty sharply because, as I say, it isn't transference isn't just one way. Yeah, yeah. You know, when people talk about the book, you know, read books about therapy and this, that, the other, and there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, the um, transferential position in terms of the client, but it's also the counter transference of the therapist. Yeah, definitely. So there's a lot in there then, Bob. Basically, it, it, what would be your top three tips to avoid? To avoid? To avoid taking, compassion fatigue. Taking too many clients on at once, especially the trauma-laden ones. Yeah to keep away from clients that may represent your own script in terms of trauma. Yeah. In other words, don't step into the positive identification trap and move away from compulsive caretaking. And the way to do that is to start looking at your own challenges in, in, in therapy. Yeah. And supervision. Yeah, yeah. Top of the list. 
yeah, supervision and therapy at the top of the list. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, I think it's really important that the supervisor also um, is on the alert for these sort of things that we're talking about. Yeah. So they need, to be, they need to be on, they need to think about it and they need to think, oh, well, okay, so he's seeing nine clients a day or she's seeing nine clients a day. Is that perhaps a bit much? Yeah. Or, you know, out of those nine clients, eight of them are pretty disturbed and have got high trauma. Is that, what's the consequence of that might be? See, I can't even, I can't, my brain can't even think about what it would be like to have eight clients that were going through quite heavy trauma it just, it just doesn't compute no that's because you've been trained in a way to think to take care of yourself to have the therapy have the supervision you come from an ethical competent place but there are therapists who put money often uh above everything else now i feel you know, quite sad when i say that but i know that's true but again, I, th I think, you know, through through therapy and supervision and, you know, the training that I've done and everything, I think I am very self-aware of my own limitations. Mm. Mm. I think one or two clients like that a week would be plenty for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's damaging both for yourself and for the other person if you yeah. don't take all these considerations uh, yeah, into... Bear this in mind. Yeah. So I hope we've not frightened anybody off, Bob. <laughs> but I think it's a I think it's a really valid subject to discuss because it is something that a lot of us as psychotherapists will maybe teeter on the edge of in our career. Yeah, and especially beginning therapists. Yeah. Uh, I, I I keep saying that because. Um, my hope, uh, and I think it's true to a certain extent, that experience, um, and especially if the person's been in a, you know, a good training program, um, but especially clinical experience, um, will teach the therapist this. Yeah. Beginning, the beginning students who start their life on placements and then in private practice, I think they're more likely to fall into this trap yeah and, and in my experience and again it's because i think we have a culture where doing is stroked very very highly yeah, yeah. The, the 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 beginning therapists have difficulties in giving themselves permission to just being yeah you know. I, th I think there is a lot of that out there though that you know, even the client to a certain extent in the early days might think, you know, we didn't really do anything. <laughs> Nothing happened. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's the problem. And partly because we live in a society and most of the therapists and students are middle class and there's a huge lot of strokes for doing things and achieving things and academic success and XXX um then of course they're into a situation where they think they've got to do something yeah. um, to be a successful effective therapist well actually the best thing they can learn is how to be i believe in the psychotherapeutic process because for so many clients have never had somebody to who's listened to them or yeah. I mean, properly listened to them who've allowed them to have the space to just talk yeah those prerequisites of a therapeutic process need to be learned and often the therapeutic or the therapy has to go with it yeah definitely a wise old man once said well i shouldn't say old because i'm talking about you bob <laughs> and I'm, I'm 71 but i suppose in today's world perhaps that is old i don't know no, no, it's not. But therapy is a process, not an event. Always. Yes. I, I, I say those words at least once a day, literally. Yeah. It, it, it's so true. And um, yeah, you're right. That's all yeah. I have to say.
good place to end the podcast. Okie dokie. So what we're going to be talking about in the next one, kind of maybe follows on from this, is what is cure for the therapist or the client oh, in therapy? Want to talk about. Yeah, so that, that we'll be doing that one next time, Bob. Until then, speak soon. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.